Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Is this working? Can you hear? Yes? Okay, good. <clears throat> so, after practicing law for about four years in Los Angeles, I was getting a bit restless, looking for a new law firm to work for. <clears throat> and after a while, I decided to take a year off and go back to Israel and study Talmud and Jewish law. So I applied and was accepted to a program in the conservative movement, that a program they had for postgraduates like me who just wanted to study Jewish texts for a year. This was before the conservative yeshiva was started. Nowadays, if you want to do what I did, you can go to the conservative yeshiva in Jerusalem, which is located right in the heart of the city, and you don't even have to go for a whole year. You can go for just a few weeks in the summer. Anyway, at the time I went, the program was housed in the building with the conservative rabbinical students, which is near the Israel Museum. I had some friends in rabbinical school, so I got to spend some time with them during the year. But I also had a second reason for going to Israel. This was back in the days before dating apps. So if you were single and you were looking for a life partner, one helpful bit of advice was to put yourself in situations where you're likely to find other people who share your interests. And I had a very strong interest in studying Jewish texts. Okay, so you might be wondering why I became a lawyer. That's a different sermon. Anyway, as you might have guessed by now, I thought that I, I might find a life partner if I put myself in a place where there's a lot of non-Orthodox Jews studying Jewish texts. So New Year's Eve that year, I went out on a sort of a blind date. The woman was studying at HUC, the Reform Seminary, which also had a program for students in Jerusalem. And I had sort of met her before. She didn't really seem to be my type. But a mutual fr friend suggested I should go out with her anyway, so I did. She's a very nice person, but we just didn't hit it off. And I'm sure everybody's had dates like this. Anyway, I came home thoroughly depressed on New Year's Eve and I went right to bed. One week later, I went to a Friday night Kabbalah Shabbat service and potluck dinner for a group of seminarians from both the Reform and the Conservative movements. And this group was, organi they organized these gatherings about once a month in different people's apartments during the year. This was the only one I went to. This particular month, the host was one of my Talmud study partners who was at the Reform Seminary she was from Paris, and when she eventually graduated and was ordained, she became the first woman rabbi in France. Anyway, for the dinner, I happened to sit down next to another HUC student who was studying to become a reform cantor. And we had one of those conversations that a lot of people seem to have where everything around you is only a blur and you're just focused on the one person who's sitting in front of you. I couldn't believe my luck. It was only one week after this other experience on New Year's Eve. But I did have one minor problem. It was Shabbat, and I don't write on Shabbat. So I, I couldn't get her phone number. And by the way, there were no cell phones at that time either. It was the dark ages. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how we managed to survive back then. Anyway, I asked her if I could walk her home. So I did, and that's how I knew what her address was. And Saturday night, I wrote a note with my phone number, and I put it in an envelope, and I even drew a stamp in the upper right corner, a picture of Groucho Marx, and I left the envelope in her mailbox. Incredibly, she called me back. And the rest, as they say, is history. Well, my story, anyway. I'll let Diane tell her story. Yeah. <laughs> but that was only part one. We had a wonderful spring semester together, but by June it was time to pack up and go back to the United States. We had only been together for about six months and we weren't quite ready to get engaged. So I planned to go back to Los Angeles and find a new job as a lawyer and Diane was going back to New York for cantorial school. Had we been ready to get married, I might have decided to apply to rabbinical school right then and just followed her to New York. But that's not how it worked out. 
I found an apartment in Los Angeles. Diane went back to New York. In August, she came out to visit me. We took a two-week two -week trip around beautiful places in California. And I think by the end of that trip, we both kind of knew that we were going to get married. But she had to go back to New York, and I had to go back to Los Angeles. So in September, I flew out to New York for her birthday. And I brought with me an engagement ring. But we were essentially living bi-coastally for the year, which is not ideal, to say the least. Now, why am I telling you my life story this morning? I usually don't like talking about myself. But this week, as I read the Torah portion, I suddenly realized that Joseph, in a way, had a very similar life experience. And my experience helps me to understand something that Joseph says in this morning's Torah portion about his own experience. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Zichrono Levracha, in one of his commentaries on the Torah portion, points out that when Joseph is in prison, he explains his life story to the Pharaoh's butler and baker in this way. This is what Joseph says. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in the dungeon. In other words, he tells his story about being kidnapped and unjustly treated. But in this morning's Torah portion, he reveals himself to his brothers, his brothers who had actually done the kidnapping and the selling him into slavery. But now he tells his life story in a very different way. Now, Joseph says, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. So then it is not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all of Egypt. Joseph has changed the way he looks at his own life story, and he helps his brothers to do the same. It is no longer a story of bitter rivalry ending in kidnapping, slavery, and unjust imprisonment. Now it is part of a grand plan with the purpose of saving tens of thousands of lives from hunger and starvation, including the lives of Joseph's own family. As Rabbi Sachs writes, in doing so, Joseph is challenging one of our most fundamental assumptions about time, namely its asymmetry. We can change the future, but we cannot change the past. But is that entirely true? What Joseph is doing for his brothers is what he clearly has done for himself. Events have changed his and their understanding of the past, which means we cannot fully understand what is happening to us now until we can look back in retrospect and see how it all turned out. This also means that we are not held captive by the past. Things can happen to us, not as dramatically perhaps as to Joseph, that can completely alter the way we look back and remember. By actions in the future, we can redeem the past. If I had not been frustrated with practicing law back then, I wouldn't have taken the year off and gone to Israel for a year. At the time, I was distressed about my career, but I took a gamble and I did something I really wanted to do, and it changed my life. And it's also changed how I look on, the, on my frustration about the practice of law. Perhaps if I had not been so disappointed on New Year's Eve, I would not have been ready to meet Diane the following week. Had we not gone in separate directions in the year after Israel, Perhaps we would not have come to value and appreciate our time together as much, which really helped us to cement our relationship. As events unfolded in my life, I have been able to reframe them to make sense and meaning out of what seemed at the time to be very difficult situations. Rabbi Sachs also mentions the work of Professor Mordechai Rotenberg of Hebrew University, who has argued that this kind of technique of reinterpreting the past could be used as a therapeutic technique rehabilitating patients suffering from a crippling sense of guilt. If we cannot change the past, then it's always there holding us back like a ball and chain around our legs. We cannot change the past, but we can reinterpret it by integrating it into a new and larger narrative. That's what Joseph was doing. And having used this, te this technique to help him survive a personal life of unparalleled ups and downs, he now uses it to help his brothers live without 
overpowering guilt. H.G. Wells published his famous book, The Time Machine, in 1896, about 130 years ago. And ever since then, people have fantasized about altering our life stories by going back in time and doing things differently. But unfortunately, we can't really do that. What we can do is change how we interpret the events in our past and reframe them in a context that helps us to deal more effectively with our present life. And once we do that, we can move forward to create a better future. So as we prepare for the new secular gear of 2024, perhaps we can re-examine the events in our own lives and reframe them in ways to find new insights and wisdom from our own experiences. And in that way, we can begin the new year with a renewed sense of purpose and meaning. Shabbat Shalom.